I'm Lee Heldman I'm from Big Fork, Montana. I'm a custom gun maker and I'm here in Las Vegas at the show, at the Minefield Show. And this is a 708 that I built uh, for myself. It is for sale, but I, it was one of my own projects. And I always wanted to do a blind magazine on a man liquor length or a full length stock. This is not a man liquor Schonauer, it's a Mauser action. But I wanted to do a blind magazine and I did one and I think it came out fine. I was a little concerned that this would be too much wood, it would look a little funny, but I think it was a success. Uh, my own trigger guard, have to, of course when you do a blind magazine, you have to come up with an independent trigger guard. I have those cut out, a whole batch of them cut out on water jet. And that's just cut in two dimensions, of course, then I have to finish it up and, and contour it and drill it. Uh, this is a piece of true French walnut, probably 50 years old, 40 years old, but it was stamped uh, in the end. It is true French walnut from France. Uh, I had that uh, squirreled away, a man liquor length, nice layout, pretty piece of wood. I used European swivels on it just because of the bit of European flair with the full length stock. The action is a shot built Kurtz length. Kurtz, K U R Z, is German for short. And this is a shortened Mexican small ring 98 Mauser to Kurtz length. Someone, I don't know who, actually shortened the receiver. I got it in a trade deal and the bolt was not shortened. So I shortened the bolt to match the receiver and then barreled it up in a 708, which is a relatively short cartridge and works in the in some of the Kurtz length actions, not all. The rings and bases uh, are standard factory bases that I contoured with a ball end mill. You can see the contour front and back. And the rings are standard loophole rings. And then on a turntable, I have made this cut on the mill and then I made a cut around here to relieve that, to add some details, to lessen the metal here, take a little metal off, not just to lighten them, but to add detail and lines to it. Uh, not the typical uh, uh, bolt stop tab. I took that off and put an island on it. Many times I do that. I stipple that and I stipple the bolt knob and on some more traditional rifles that have full bottom metal I would stipple the little lever in here when you do one thing on a rifle you try to do something else to complement it for example I don't have it on here but some guys will put a gold band on here or up here when you put one gold band in one spot you need to put another one back here on a, another spot to, to give it balance artistic balance if you will Everything in a barrel is integral or integral if you prefer front sight base, quarter rib, and the little boss under the barrel just goes in. Those are all integral. I don't know who made the barrel right offhand. I've had it for years. I believe it was Rick Stickley. I'm not sure of that. So I remodeled this, added some contour here. It was it was right off a milling machine, so, so it has flats here, or did have. I, I smoothed them out. I intend to have an engraver cut a nice oval here, a line, and then stipple that as well as the front sight. Cut an oval there and stipple it to make it look more like a, a traditional ramp. Typically for glare, they would do that. They would take the glare off of that, and this would simply be done here to match it. And that's probably about all I can tell you. Uh, the trigger, most of my rifles are more slender here, top to bottom, than most guys would make them. When I do that, I push the bottom metal, if it has a, a, a regular floor plate, traditional bottom metal, I take metal off the top of the magazine, push that up, lessen this dimension, that lessens this dimension, that allows me to make a more slender grip. I use a long, open, slender grip more slender uh, 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 than most gun makers would make. I lessen this dimension and that's kind of what I go by. I measure the bottom of the raceway here and here and that allows me to finish the metal and get the dimension I want there. 
you can reference that on other rifles that have a big fat grip you can measure that go to another one that has a slender rifle and there's a good reference point uh, then when I do all that typically the trigger sticks down too far so I take the trigger off this is probably a Blackburn um, I use a lot of Blackburn triggers. I use some rarely Timonies, but I use a few Timonies. I knock the pin out, the pivot pin out, pull the trigger out, make typically make a whole new trigger and put that back in. That lets me reposition the, we call it the anchor. Uh, that lets me reposition that. I like uh, European swivels simply because I don't care for the, the quick detachable that everyone uses because it's a big mechanism and it kind of flops around. Uh, I've elongated this kind of to go with the general lines of the whole rifle and uh, made this from from uh, uh, water jet started with the water jet I think I mentioned that did I not uh, and I made that a little longer than most of them again to go with this typically my blind magazines this this a scutcheon would be a little bit shorter, but I think it uh, it's proportioned well with the rest of the bet rifle. It? Bet it? Bet it. There is contact up here, and any time you have contact up here, or, or let's call it pressure up here, where this is screwed into the barrel, you're going to have pressure there. Likewise, on the old Winchester Model 70s that use the barrel tie-down, the reason all the old... I'm rambling here a little bit. The reason the old Model 70 Winchesters, you see, people always removed that screw and threw it away. That's because it was, it was machine inletted and they didn't have perfect contact. When you do this either with a full length stock like this or a barrel tie down like one of the others here I can show you, you absolutely have to bed that. So that right in that area needs to be bedded with bedding material, acro glass, or, or one of the such materials. And with this in a relaxed state, relatively relaxed, that needs to be squeezed together so that when you tighten that screw up, it goes back to the exact same place every time. The reason those Model 70s would change point of impact, without proper bedding right where that screw would be, every time they touched that screw or the temperature or moisture changed it would change the pressure on the forehead to do that right you also need some some guys will say high-end guns shouldn't need any uh, bedding acro glass type stuff with something like that you're going to need to do that uh, let me show you one other one and what i'm talking about for the barrel tie down this is the barrel tie down on this that likewise also absolutely must be perfect bedding right in that immediate area and the only way you're going to get perfect bedding in there is with bedding material unless you're a lot better in letter than i am and i don't think i have any glass on the recoil lug on the on the other one uh that i just showed you sometimes certainly on heavy recoil calibers i will will bed with bedding material or acro glass, I will bed the recoil area. This is one I was almost, well, I was half done building it and the customer died of cancer. This was the ninth rifle I was building for him. So I bought the parts from him before he died and finished it up for myself. I told him I would save that. In memory of him, he was a friend, and I, I hunted with him a little bit, even more than, than the normal client. So, this is my own rifle now. What type of finish, Lee? Uh, sanded in oil finish. I just went blank. I can't think of the name of the uh, velvet oil. It's called velvet oil. And I did something a little different here. You might get a profile of that. Most most recoil uh, um, cheek pieces. Our, our radius down this way. This is what carpenters would call a uh, Roman Ogi uh, or OG, whatever it is. However, architecturally, it's called a Sema Recta. I have a brother in law who's an architect, and he's, he told me that's a Sema Recta or a Sema Reversa, depending on which way it goes. Do you believe that? Everything. Okay.
Well, the rifle we were talking about is actually this one. The intention of this rifle was to make, this is actually a 270 Winchester uh, caliber rifle, is to make the lightest possible rifle I could make with a scope and a set of sights on it. Uh, the barrel on the rifle is only 22 inches instead of the normal 24. Tack Octagon, it was uh, built by John Pell of Trinidad, Colorado. Uh, John Pell has since died, but that's all he did was make barrels. The receiver is a 364 model 70 Winchester receiver. It's got a very lightweight, uh, low power, Liverpool scope on it. It has uh, five panel checkering on the bolt. The bolt was checkered uh, by me on a kneel, which I don't recommend. Uh, and I'm not sure that you can even kneel Winchester metal enough to actually make the checkering easy. Uh, the other thing that uh, is the precise reason that I have this gun apart at this show is to show people if they're interested what wood to metal finish inletting actually looks like because most people don't actually look at the inletting after the gun is together. Wood to metal fit means exactly what it sounds like. It means that uh, the metal is in contact with all parts of the wood that it's uh, uh, in. If my attitude is if a person is willing to spend the money or pay the price to get uh, what is referred to as a custom gun, a true custom gun, they deserve to get uh, the highest quality uh, possible from the uh, gun maker. Uh, and that's basically what this represents. Now we have another gun on the, on the, the table lady in the right. that's exactly the same. If I took the, uh, the metal out of this gun, it'd look exactly the same from a wood to metal kit as uh, this gun does. Uh, anyway, um, in order to actually get to the point where you can actually do this comfortably, you have to resign yourself to the fact that it takes a considerable amount of time. Uh, it's pretty important that you enjoy uh, taking time to get everything right uh, and do it slow. Uh, you'll get a lot of self-satisfaction out of the end product if you do it that way and it's obvious that you have to do more than one right? you have to do it over and over and over again eventually it becomes pretty second nature paul this particular rifle uh if you were to sell it uh on the retail market what would be your price this rifle yes sir or this rifle either one tell us about okay this one is has eight thousand dollars metal work done by steve Hallman in it and there's a lot of specialized things in this gun. Uh, this gun, when it's finished, it's not finished in the white right now. Uh, I'm in the process of engraving it. I've already inletted some gold back here. Uh, when it's finished, uh, it would be in the $26,000, $28,000 uh, price range. This gun down here would be uh, based on some of the uh, unique uh, metal uh, changes that have been done would be around six thousand dollars and this is my hunting rifle and that would uh, cost approximately uh, forty three hundred dollars so what I'm, what you're actually seeing is you're seeing the difference between uh, an affordable uh, simple hunting gun made on a custom basis versus a, a very fancy hunting gun uh, where there's other expenses involved that uh, bring the price up to a price most people can't afford. Paul, based on your experience, is there a market for this? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. 
I just finished uh, making two stocks, one for a Fabry shotgun and one for a Bosa's. The Fabry uh, original cost was approximately $150,000 and the Bosa's was approximately $100,000. Okay. There are people that have an interest, a keen interest, in best quality uh, firearms that have so much money they'll never spend it the rest of their life so they can buy virtually anything. What they look for is they look for the best of the best and they know what they're buying. Uh, if you ever have to do work for one of those kinds of people, don't cut corners because they'll find out you cut corners and you won't get repeated business. Uh, give them what it is they're looking for and that is the uh, absolute best that can be uh, purchased at the time that the purchase is made. Uh, that is the market. You mentioned, you mentioned earlier uh, on this video that it takes some time to get to this particular standard of quality. How long did it take for you like, to get to this point? I've been checkering guns for 55 years. I've been making stocks for approximately 30 years. I've been engraving for approximately 20 years. Uh, and I'm still not at the level that's competitive with the best engravers uh, here at this uh, show. Uh, I can compete with anybody that makes stocks. Uh, and I would say one of the problems, I'll tell you one of the problems that I have with uh, the younger uh, gunsmiths or the people that want to do this kind of work is that they want to be able to do it almost immediately and they get frustrated when you tell them the time that's involved. The fact of the matter is, is everybody that does this has a lot of years of experience behind them and you have to be patient and develop your skills uh, at tooling. Uh, over whatever time it takes for you to achieve a certain level of quality in your product uh, and not worry about whether or not you can do this in uh, one year, two years, or three years. And everybody has different uh, skill levels. Some people can uh, understand and advance uh, very fast and some people it's just a slow process. Uh, one of the issues with the guild is the guild uh, refers to itself in a lot of cases as being gray. Uh, the reason it's gray is because in order to get in the guild, you have to be able to demonstrate skills that might take 20 or 30 years to achieve. Uh, so it doesn't really mean anything other than we have the desire to bring in as many young people as we possibly can because we all know that we're not going to be able to do this for many, many more years. I probably have another 10 years and I won't be able to do this anymore. And I want to make sure that I pass on everything that I can to anybody that's interested in uh, to get them to do the same thing I'm doing, but I don't want to see the, uh, the art form die. So your, your one bit of advice to a new person would be to do what? It's just be patient, uh, acquire as much reference material as you can possibly put your hands on, uh, constantly study that reference material to figure out how these people actually were able to create what you're looking at. And then uh, when uh, you have that, constantly refer back to it when you have questions. I have a library that probably has a thousand books in it, and I know what's in each book. Uh, talk to as many of the artisans as you possibly can. Uh, they are absolutely willing. There are no secrets in this business. They are absolutely willing to tell you anything that they know and help you uh, sort things out by asking any question that you can ask. One of the beauties of uh, having a guild, which is uh, based basically a definition of a guild. Uh, Like-minded people uh, sharing techniques and uh, approaches and anything it takes to uh, improve the product. Uh, 
we don't actually compete with each other for work. Most of us uh, have a backlog uh, that in some cases is a repeat backlog. Uh, that doesn't require us to advertise. Uh, it doesn't require us to uh, actually compete with a uh, fellow country. So that's why we share things freely. So never hesitate on getting on the phone and calling any at, I can speak at least for our guild members, uh, any custom gunmaker guild members or uh, farms and gravers guild members uh, to ask them questions. They'll answer anything that you ask them. If they don't have the answer, they'll get the answer for you. Uh, and I even do that today. I actually call different people about different issues and uh, uh, sort things out quite quickly uh, how to approach it. An example of that was the Fabian Nebosis. I'd never seen a Fabian Nebosis before. When I took on the job, I wasn't even sure how to take the stock off of the dog and take it. So I called some people that had some experience with Fabians and asked them, what do I look out for when I take this thing apart? And uh, it turned out to be relatively simple, but I didn't want to uh, start dismantling a gun that uh, costs that much money for fear that something might get damaged if I didn't do it right. A lot of those guns have sequences, you know, for disassembly and assembly. So consult with people. Never hesitate to pick up the phone and talk to somebody. Is his point of the comb where he has the flutes. Al uses a flute design. Some of the gun makers do not use flute designs. Paul Linke, as he said a minute ago, is in the engraving, as you can see in the mirror on the floor plate. Absolutely gorgeous Florida Lee checkering. Thank you. 